Hello Bio 400. This screencast is going to be about polymerase chain reaction and also about gel electrophoresis, also known as DNA fingerprinting. Both PCR and gel electrophoresis function because all the cells in your body share the same genetic code. If an individual drops a hair, some skin cells, blood, or other bodily fluids, we can cross-match them with criminal databases. However, one small drop of blood is not going to be enough to run the chemical reactions we need to cross-match them. So, we use a reaction called polymerase chain reaction in order to duplicate the DNA so we have enough to run the cross-matching procedures. PCR duplicates the DNA several thousand to several million times, even from a very small segment. Let's say that we hope to amplify this segment of DNA right here. It is only 16 bases long, which isn't enough to run gel electrophoresis, and so we need to run PCR on it. The first step of the PCR reaction is called denaturation. This is where we're going to apply heat to the DNA in order to split it in half. The heat breaks the hydrogen bonds that usually exist between the nucleotide base pairs. In the second step of PCR, which is called annealing, the DNA is cooled enough to allow a primer to attach to the three prime end of each strand. The primer serves as a marker for something called TAC polymerase. Remember that in DNA replication, DNA polymerase adds nucleotides to the sides of the DNA molecule in order to make more of it. TAC polymerase is going to function similarly, but this polymerase is heat resistant, meaning that it won't be ripped apart by the higher temperatures. The two TAC polymerases then move down the strand of the DNA. As they move, they create the complementary strand. We now have two identical strands made from only one original strand. During the third part of the reaction, extension, we can repeat steps one and two as many times as necessary. We'll split the DNA molecule using heat, then we'll attach primers, and then use TAC polymerase to attach free-floating nucleotide bases. The more times we repeat this reaction, the more times we'll magnify the amount of DNA. Now let's move on to gel electrophoresis, also known as DNA fingerprinting. The phrase gel electrophoresis literally means splitting via electricity. Remember that this is the basic structure of DNA. The phosphate groups here on the sides of the DNA molecule have a slight negative charge. Remember also that the nitrogen bases that are in the center of the DNA molecule, the combination is unique to each individual. You can't simply look at a DNA molecule and see the sequence of A's and T's and C's and G's, and so we have to use other methods to figure out exactly what the person's sequence is. Here we have three people's DNA. They all look exactly the same except for the color, and so we're going to chop them into pieces using something called a restriction enzyme. A restriction enzyme is a protein that hunts along the DNA molecule and looks for a specific combination of nitrogen bases. Then it cuts between them in a very specific way. This is my first restriction enzyme. It's going to look for this exact combination of nitrogen bases among all of these different DNA molecules. When it sees that combination, it's going to chop it into pieces in that space. So here is my restriction enzyme, and it's going to look along this DNA molecule. And then it's going to look along this one. And it's going to look along this one. And it's going to chop them each into different pieces based on where it sees this combination of bases. So here's my restriction enzyme, and it's going to look along this first green DNA molecule. Let's pretend that it saw two of this special combination of nitrogen bases, and so it chopped the DNA molecule into a small, a medium, and a large piece. When it looks along the second red molecule, however, it might see that combination in a different place. It might only see this combination of bases one time instead of two times, and so the pieces would be different sizes. But what if your restriction enzyme travels along this last one, and it cuts it into pieces that are exactly the same as one of the previous two? As we can see, the blue DNA molecule was cut in exactly the same places as the green molecule. The restriction enzyme saw the key set of nitrogen bases in these two places, and it cut it in those two places accordingly. However, anything that's in between here could be totally different than what we saw here in the green molecule. The only thing that was the same was the restriction enzyme cutting sites. So how can we be sure that this person right here and this person right here are the same? 
The most logical step is to add a second restriction enzyme that will cut in a different place than the first one did. So now my new restriction enzyme is going to check all of these molecules for potential sites to chop the DNA molecule. Let's pretend that it didn't find a single site to chop the DNA in the green molecule, but it did find a new one in the red molecule and also in the blue molecule. Now, none of these match up with each other. They are all completely different in terms of the length of their fragments. But what if they weren't? What if you still had two that looked exactly the same? Is there another way to do this? And the answer is yes. You could either add another restriction enzyme, or you could use something called radioactive tagging. To demonstrate the power of radioactive tagging in gel electrophoresis, we're going to go back to a scenario where the red molecule was cut differently than the green and the blue molecules. Similar to a restriction enzyme, a radioactive tag will search along the DNA molecules for specific combinations of bases. When it finds them, it will attach to the side of the molecule, thereby marking it. When we put the DNA molecules under a certain kind of light, they will show up in a bright color. So here is my radioactive tag, and it's going to search along each of these molecules. And then when it sees a site that matches up with its code, it's going to tag that particular chunk of DNA. So let's pretend that we see the radioactive tags AGC sequence in this little teeny tiny green segment, in this bigger red segment, and then in the medium-sized blue segment. Now, even though the green and the blue DNA molecules were carved into different chunks, we can tell that they have a different sequence of bases because they didn't get tagged in exactly the same spot. If it was DNA from the same person, we would see that they would have the same length chunks and they would also be tagged radioactively along the same spot. We're now going to use these fake segments of DNA to run a gel electrophoresis experiment. A gel electrophoresis plate has a negative charge at one end and a positive charge at the other end and is filled with a jelly-like substance made of agar. A gel electrophoresis plate has a negative charge at one end and a positive charge at the other end. The agar gel held in the middle of the plate has small holes in it, kind of like a screen. This means that large molecules will get stuck, whereas smaller molecules will be able to slip through. We're now going to load our green, red, and blue DNA into each of their own lanes at the negative end of the gel electrophoresis plate. Remember that DNA has a negative charge, and so as soon as we turn on the plate, the negative charged end of the plate will repel the DNA molecules. Let's pretend that our green DNA molecule had fragment lengths of 3, 5, and 7. Our red one had lengths of 1, 3, and 10, and our blue one had 3, 5, and 7. We're going to mark those on our gel electrophoresis sheet, just as we would if we had turned on the plate. When we turn on the gel electrophoresis plate, the different fragments will move away from the negative end and towards the positive end. In the green DNA, the 3 segment is the smallest, and so it will travel the farthest away from the negative end. The 5 segment is going to be a little bit bigger and more bulky, and so it's more likely to travel less far, whereas the 7 fragment is going to travel the least far of the 3. We will see exactly the same pattern with the blue DNA because the fragments are all the same length. However, we're likely to see something different with the red one. The tiniest fragment of the red DNA would travel almost all the way to the end of the gel electrophoresis plate. The three-length fragment would travel about the same as the, red and, as the blue and green fragments. And then the number 10 one, the one that had a lot of bases, would travel a very small distance because it was so big and bulky. When we shine the plate under ultraviolet light, we can also see which fragments were tagged radioactively. At the moment, it looks like the green person and the blue person might have had the same DNA. However, when we shine it under the light, we can see that that's not true anymore. Even though the DNA fragments for the green person and the blue person were the same length, we can see that they were radioactively tagged differently. So even though the chunks had the same number of bases, they didn't have exactly the same combination of bases because some of them were tagged in the green one that were not tagged in the blue one and vice versa. Now let's add a fourth person into the mix. We're going to make this person purple. This fourth purple person is going to be a bank robber and they left some DNA at a crime scene, so we'll call it a piece of hair. The scientists have now performed PCR and have magnified the chunk of DNA that was left at the crime scene and they're hoping to cross-match it with a database of criminals who have previously committed crimes. They've applied their restriction enzymes and applied radioactive tags, and here is what they got. 
Now our question becomes, is the purple person, the person that we know robbed the bank, are they the same person as person number one, number two, or number three? So take a minute to think about this question. So hopefully by now you've had a chance to think about this. And even though if we look at person number four, we can see that they have the same length RFLPs, or chunks of DNA, as person number one and person number three, we can see that the radioactivity pattern is different. So even though this person might by chance have had the same length pieces of DNA, they would be radioactively tagged in a different way because the sequence of bases is different. So unfortunately, even if n person number one, number two, and number three were all in the criminal database, none of them is an exact match for person number four, and so the criminal would still be out there somewhere. So I hope this was somewhat helpful, and I will see you all in class.